six minutes. Uh, any over thing will cause negative marking. Second. The first speaker would be Dr. Narin Shetty. He'll be talking on uh, comfortable and safe 3D heads up visualization solution for fake emulsification. I would request all the speakers to come to the front row and sit. All the presenters. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I thank AIS for giving me this opportunity. So today I'm going to talk about 3D visualization system. Okay. So the evolution of microscope has come a really a long way, but actually have we progressed or regressed? So this, this is where in 2018, the 3D visualization system called Engineery came to picture. We, we adopted this to take care of three people. First, the doctors, then the patients, then the trainees. So let's look at the first one. As you all know, I think, uh, you know, uh, the neck pain and the back pain has been an occupational hazard in uh, ophthalmology. And especially if you're training, you sit, end up sitting in a very awkward position and uh, it really breaks your neck and back. But with the 3D system, you can actually use your backrest of your uh, chair, relax back and look at a screen and then operate. And even more so when you're training a student, you can stand anywhere in the OT and uh, you know look at the screen and train, train the trainees accordingly. The next thing is, how did we take care of our patients? Uh, we took care of the patients because with the 3D system, we can really operate at a very low illumination because of which uh, the patients are more comfortable eventually more cooperative and you end up doing the surgery better. So this is just 5% illumination. This is how the video looks like and this is 100% illumination. The next is taking care of our trainees. This has been a boon to uh, the trainees. It has really shortened the learning curve. And uh, as you all know, in a traditional microscope, you're limited to one or two uh, side viewing uh, scopes. But in the 3D system, you're, there's, uh, there's unlimited, you know, any, any, any student who has a cheap 3D glasses, they just wear it and look at the screen and you're, they're good to go from day one. Doesn't matter, you're a junior, senior uh, fellow. You can just wear the 3D glasses and from day one, you're looking at the depth perception and uh, which really helps you in your learning. So I just want to show a series of uh, cases. This is a soft cataract, and yes, you can chop any grade of cataract. Even the soft cataract is uh, so much more easier. So uh, this is a chopper which I designed, uh, where uh, you know you even chopping a soft or the hardest of the cataract. I just use a dialer, nothing else. Now uh, in a hard, I mean NS2, uh, as you can see, the chopping is much easier. So. What is very key in this is the phaco tip shouldn't move. After you've got a hole, please do not move your phaco tip when you're chopping. This protects the zonules and doesn't break, uh, doesn't cause iatrogenic uh, breaks. Even in an uh, intumescent cataract, doing a rexus is, uh, is extremely easy. In fact, this is one of my first cases. Uh, and uh, usually I do a smaller rexus, then uh, eventually I enlarge it later on. So you can even appreciate the visco being washed from the endothelium. Uh, and that is the level of clarity that you have with the system. Uh, here you can see me polishing the bag and for a second I hold the posterior capsule and then release it. Let, let's look at it a little more closer. So here you can see me holding the capsule and there's a you know spidering of the bag and then I release it. This is possible only if there is no lag between the reality and the, the screen. So that is, that is the beauty of the machine, which is instant uh, feedback that you get on, on the screen. Even uh, doing surgery on these kind of black cataracts uh, is, is a breeze. Uh, so there are some few tricks on uh, making sure that you have a good clear cornea the next day is whenever you're doing your quadrant removal, uh, keep and whenever you press step three, keep the phaco tip right in the center of the eye at the iris plane. The next thing is uh, do not move your phaco tip when you're pressing uh, three. You can move when you're in two or one, but do not move it when you're pressing three. Keep it uh, steady and central. The next thing is I always remove my second hand piece. You can see I have no second hand piece at all because once I finish my chopping, I take it out because it creates a beautiful fluidix within the chamber because there's only one inlet and one outlet. So we did a study where we compared the 3D system with the standard operating microscope. And uh, this was a prospective randomized uh, study where we had 224 uh, patients and five surgeons. 
the primary endpoint was to see the ease of visualization of uh, different steps uh, during FACO surgery and also look at the outcomes of the surgery. This was the scoring which was given to every surgeon. And when we look at the results, the neck discomfort was much more in a patient or significantly more in, uh, in surgeons who operated on a standard operating microscope. And when we uh, look at the brightness and illumination was much lower. That means the surgeons were able to operate at a much lower illumination uh, in an Ingenuity system or the 3D system as compared to a standard operating microscope. When we look at post-operative day one AC cells and flare, uh, there, was, there was no significant difference between the two groups. And when we look at the visualization uh, during the different steps of the surgery, there wasn't any significant difference. This is, uh, we had a similar kind of picture even in the subgroup of mature cataract. I'd like to conclude by saying the surgeons were able to operate with a significantly lesser illumination. It provides a much better neck comfort during the surgery and patients were significantly more comfortable and more cooperative under the ingenuity system. And lastly, it is a hands down superior tool in training students. Thank you for your time. Uh, excellent uh, presentation, Dr. Nain, but I just would like to know what was the time taken to learn this procedure because something like laparoscopic uh, surgery. Uh, absolutely, sir. Actually, uh, I was also thinking when I looked at it first and uh, I, I thought, okay, I'm going to take time. But it's just, if you're used to microscope, it's just like, you know, at one certain point, I used to forget that I'm looking at the screen on day one itself. I don't know, it's just... Uh, it just happens at in a breeze. I don't know, we're just used to certain technologies, so it's absolutely no learning curve. In fact, I've, uh, the same day I used it the first time, I usually uh, train my fellows at the end of the day, and I put, no, no, you ca carry on, I told her to, uh, to also do it on the 3D system, and she did it, she did it a fantastic job too. Good afternoon, Naren, fantastic slides. I must congratulate you on the, on the layout of slides, Thank really you. beautiful. Just wanted to ask you, where do you keep your monitor? Is it right in front of you, or is it at the foot end of the patient? Right. Uh, th uh, thank you for the questions. So basically, we have two ways. One, uh, even, see, some people have a mind block that, okay, if you have a small operating theater, it's going to be a hassle moving the screen and everything else. So actually, if you have a bed where the patient bed moves, it's much easier. Because that way, you can actually change the position. You can be still, the, the screen can be still, and you move the patient bed accordingly. If it is the right eye, the head will be facing one side. If it is the opposite side, the leg will be facing the other side. So what happens is that way you don't need to move much. The screen doesn't move much. The patient head or the patient's table keeps moving. The other way also is, uh, I mean... Uh, so we, you find that easier to move yeah. the... Patient yes, yes, stable yes. 360 degrees around. Yes, 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 yes. It's very, very easy also. And it's like instant. No, what because I was asking was, do you keep the screen right in front of your eyes or do you also torque your neck yeah. to visualize on the screen? I, I because usually if you, don't. I saw you operating on, sitting on the superior end. If you're doing a temporal section, what would be your preference? No, that's actually a temporal itself. I usually don't do superior. But even in a temporal one, you don't need to. There's a small trick where you keep your bed height low. If you keep the patient bed height low, what happens, the microscope also goes low. Because the microscope goes low, there's nothing stopping from your vision. And then you can actually directly see the screen and then operate. So that's a small trick where you keep the bed as low as possible so that everything becomes easy. And uh, the surgeons forget when they're operating on 3D uh, microscope is that you actually can rest back. We're so used to sitting up straight and looking like this. Actually, for a change, we can actually use the backrest of the chair. You can lean back on the chair and then operate like that. So that's really amazing. And none of the steps ever produced a lag? No, absolutely not. I, I just showed you those, you know, the, the instant where it caught the capsule and I released it. It can happen only if there's yeah, no I, lag. I yeah. saw that, but uh, to yeah. my experience, it actually the lag is a little evident. It's not in the other steps as well, but in, while you polish the capsules, it's just evident a fraction. Yeah. Other steps you can't notice it, but while you polish the capsules, it's just evident a fraction. But it's nothing. I mean, you can get used to it very fast. Thank you. Correct. Dr. Correct. Narayan, I have uh, two questions. Yes, sir. One is it uh, what happens if the connectivity is lost or some wiring problem? Can you switch over to the traditional? Definitely, sir. Instantly. And, instantly. Yeah. And another issue: uh, Will there be any uh, more uh, time uh, taken when you're operating on this engine? No, no, absolutely not. As yes. compared to the traditional. It's one. the same, sir. The duration, the at least, uh, I usually operate. Uh, 
about 20 25 cases per day sir but uh, usually i take about 8 cases per hour i mean the same similar it's comparable kind. same sir same, absolutely same. so if it's okay can i present my other presentation sir if it's there is, is it okay thanks thank you sir shall we he yeah. has another presentation yeah yeah, yeah carry on Thank you. So uh, the, the other topic which I'll be talking today is predicting preoperative biomarkers for exaggerated of uh, retinal pathologies post cataract surgery. I know it's a very small title. So I'm sure each one of us have had uh, days where we have done a perfect cataract surgery, but post surgery you end up with some retinal pathology, either macular edema or so, or sometimes you have scenarios where you have retinal pathology and then after the surgery, it has progressed and you re feel really bad and patient finally blames you. So to solve this question, uh, we, we thought, okay, can we actually predict before surgery itself, which patients can show worsening of retinal pathologies post cataract surgery? So we did a prospective interventional uh, study uh, where we uh, looked at 226 eyes. These were the inclusion and exclusion criteria. And we did a detailed examination from slit lamp to fundus photo and OCT macula at every visits. The aqueous was collected in all patients and also the follow-up was done at one month, three months, six months, and 12 months. And we divided the groups between uh, the two. First was based on the systemic illness, where we look at patients who had only diabetes. The second one, only hypertension. The third one was both hypertension and diabetes. And the second group, uh, depending on the presence or absence of retinal pathology. So as you can see the results, th there was a significant increase in uh, uh, or higher levels of VIGF and uh, MCP1 in uh, groups uh, in patients who had both hypertension and diabetes as compared to the hypertension group. And when we look at retinal pathologies, uh, the VIGF and other inflammatory markers were significantly higher in patients who required post-surgery uh, retinal treatments. So, so now we know that definitely there is uh, a chance that once you do the surgery that the already existing retinal pathology can increase in the future. Then there are certain biomarkers which you can pick up to see what, uh, who are those patients. So in fact, we are correlating these, uh, the biomarkers with the tears also so that we can do a more uh, non-invasive test before the surgery. Uh, that way it's much easier for every doctor to do so. So basically what uh, results we saw is we had the patients with diabetes and hypertension had significantly higher VIGES than uh, uh, MCP1 as compared to the hypertension group and also the higher levels of uh, VIGES and inflammatory markers were observed in patients requiring treatment uh, uh, post-surgery uh, because of the retinal issues. So this is our concept. Basically first we identify, second is we isolate, third is we do a customized treatment for that patient, not just the patient the eye. So we have devised a kit, a diagnostic kit, which is a, a low cost diagnostic kit, which any, uh, you know, a solo practitioner in his clinic can have it next to him. And what do we do with this? How does the flow look like? First, we need to collect the tears from the patient and then put a buffer into it. And then once you have done that, you can put this into the cartridge and then the cartridge into the diagnostic kit. So once you have done this, uh, within 90 minutes, you'll have the results in your hand. So what do we do with the results? So if you see any kind of, uh, you know, high levels of VIGF or uh, inflammatory markers, uh, you know, preoperative itself, you can uh, make sure the patient that is strict control of systemic illness, no matter what it is. And also maybe uh, depending on the situation, you have to, maybe you can inject, uh, you know, intravenous uh, injections or so before the surgery itself. Then you go ahead with the surgery and then again you need to closely follow up these patients so that the earliest sign of any changes you can pick it up quickly, treat it so that the outcomes are much better and uh, obviously look for any inflammatory sequence in the diabetes and so on and so forth. So basically we are come to a new era where uh, you know we, we are able to identify the biomarkers and create a very customized treatment for patients, uh, that way, you know, we're not doing these blanket treatments where we just uh, do everything and then uh, finally we are nowhere. So I'd like to conclude by saying the same where the assessment of uh, biomarkers in aqueous and tears can help in early diagnosis of retinal pathologies, resulting in better surgical outcomes of patients undergoing cataract surgery.
thank you for your time dr narain what are the correlation you are making with uh, the disease aspects there are so many retinal pathologies exactly sir so uh, what we are looking here in this study is doesn't matter what condition it is sir. from diabetes to even sometimes you know uh, a completely normal retina you have you end up with the macular edema so we have taken all those biomarkers now we are uh, in the processing to correlate with the tears so i mean once that is done you know anybody i mean it's much easier to answer to the patient also because you know what's going to happen and you tell the patient see look this is going to happen for you so we need to do this but still you're at risk so if you say this you know the patients who develop complications post surgery they're more accepting and uh, more understanding also so what's been your understanding thus far uh, you categorized the patients into three groups diabetes alone hypertension stand alone and both of them combined so where do you up till now the observations what do yeah. you suggest where no, do the markers see the, the the whole purpose of doing groups is to see the uniqueness of each disease or to differentiate the biomarkers which biomarker belongs to which group or having certain these kind of uh, scenarios of biomarkers you will end up with this particular problem so to identify that we have to do these uh, subgroups into you know uh, be it retinal pathology no retinal pathology or diabetes hypertension and so on and so forth so that you know identifying the biomarkers is much easier in the lab no what i was asking was say you have a patient who has a diabetes yeah and vis-a-vis -a, -vis a patient who has hypertension yes, yes, yes. and you're going to operate yes, on yes. that particular patient so does your what has your observation led to do you have to be more careful with diabetes stand alone or diabetes hypertension combined or hypertension stand alone what's your right. observation right as of led now to? as of now the combination of the two are more higher risk of complications so if you would have had a patient who's got both diabetes and hypertension and cataract and you've operated right you probably would have called that patient back for a follow up if yes. the diseases are 5 years or more Definitely. any which way in every 6 months so has that changed now exactly. after you've seen so so it's not like every patient of diabetes and hypertension is going to end up like this see we can be let's say if we uh, okay now if you know the biomarker that it is a 100% chance that post surgery you're going to develop with macular edema or the worsening of this you will be more aggressive in pre operative treatment itself forget about uh, post operative because pre operative they they won't listen to certain injections when it's not indicated but if you know these biomarkers okay you will end up with the uh, edema or something like that you know uh, you know a pre operative uh, injection uh, into the vitreous uh, you know would would help the patient in in a big way in a big so way you doing that no not as of now not as, not of, as now. of now so because we want to Yes yes because we need to uh, have larger data and uh, you know publish it and then go ahead because we can't do it uh, but thank you thank you comparison to the other three who been selected from the other sections <coughs> can i call upon the next uh, presenter dr manpreet kaur oh, no doctor i'm sorry dr krishna sahiti Dr. Krishna Sahiti. Is the doctor not there? The paper doctor. on technique a way to achieve <coughs> intact rexis in intubation cataract. She's not there. Uh, the next uh, presenter would be Dr. Manpreet Kaur. She would be talking on intraoperative posterior polar cortical disc defect sign uh, of a sign of intact posterior capsule
a very good evening to all of you i would be presenting intraoperative posterior polar cortical disc defect sign a sign of in intact posterior capsule no financial disclosures so posterior polar cataract as we all know is a surgical challenge even for the experienced cataract surgeons with a risk of pcr of up to 36% and about 1/5 of the patients have a pre-existing posterior capsule defect so we all have been looking for risk stratification so we can know beforehand predict the cases that will open up preoperatively slit lamp signs have been described based on the size of the posterior polar disc and satellite mini cataract surrounding the main posterior polar plaque anterior segment optical coherence tomography ultrasound and pentacam features have been evaluated to predict the risk of opening up during surgery intraoperative oct has emerged as a useful tool in fact we have uh, come up with a new classification using IOCT in which three types of posterior polar cataract have been identified with various risk of intraoperative PC dehiscence. However, not all of us have access to the latest IOCT or anterior segment OCT and basic clinical signs are what will help a majority of us to help in risk stratification. So the aim of the study was to describe the incidence of posterior polar cortical disc defect sign observed during phaco emulsification in posterior polar cataract and to study the morphological characteristics of the sign and its relation to the intraop surgical dynamics and posterior capsule dehiscence. It was a prospective case series in which we enrolled patients more than 18 years with posterior polar cataract at RP Center for Ophthalmic Sciences, AIMS, New Delhi. The diagnosis of posterior polar cataract was based on slit lamp examination of a well-circumscribed onion ring or bullseye-shaped posterior polar opacity with or without associated nucleus sclerosis. Of note, patients with pre-existing PC defect that we sometimes do observe on slit lamp were excluded. Patients more than 18 years of age with posterior polar cataract diagnosed on slit lamp examination giving consent were included for the study. So what is a posterior polar cortical disc defect sign? This was based on an observation that a donut shaped central defect in the posterior cortex with surrounding whitish gray rim of variable thickness and relatively sharp margins is observed during surgery in posterior polar cataracts and the size of the defect roughly corresponds to the preoperative size of the posterior plaque as you can see on the right hand side. So materials and methods, a slow motion phaco emulsification using active fluidic system was performed, a gentle hydrodelineation dissection was avoided, the PPCDD or the posterior polar cortical disc defect sign was observed after the aspiration of nucleus and epinuclear plate and stage of appearance of the sign based on the number of layers aspirated before it was seen was noted. Statistical tests were performed as appropriate. So 67 eyes were included, the mean age of patients was 55.1 plus minus 6.7 years. Seven eyes were excluded. Of these, two had a pre-existing PC defect as seen on slit lamp. Two had dense cataract which precluded PC assessment and three eyes had coexisting posterior segment pathology. So the posterior polar cortical disc defect sign was observed in 87% of the eyes. In 13% of the eyes, we did not see this sign while doing a posterior polar cataract surgery. What was the type of signs? There was a partial disc defect observed in 6.9% cases in which the incomplete margins of variable arc size were observed. Complete disc defect sign was observed in 93.1% cases in which complete well circumscribed rim was seen and a central pseudo defect like a PCR but the PC was intact. So the stage of appearance of the sign was after epinuclear plate aspiration in 89.6% following majority of the cortex aspiration and only the penultimate layer remained in 8.6% and following nuclear emulsification in 1.7%. So in a majority of cases, it was observed after the epinuclear plate had been aspirated and the cortex was still remaining. So nine eyes did not have PPCDD sign in our series. Of these two eyes or 22.2%, we had an end block aspiration of the cortex and posterior plaque and we did not see the sign. In three eyes, there was adherence of the posterior plaque to the posterior capsule till the end. And in four eyes, a PC rupture was observed during separation of the posterior plaque and the posterior polar cortical disc defect sign could not be observed. So the 
incidence of pcr in eyes without the ppcdd sign was significantly higher than in eyes with the sign 44.4% versus 0% with a significant p value of less than 0.001 no case had a pcr during hydrodelineation no case had intraoperative nucleus drop pcr could be implanted in the bag in 65 eyes and sulcus in 2 eyes all patients had a uncorrected visual acuity of 20-25 or better at the end of 1 month and no case developed any cystoid macroedema or corneal decompensation so coming to the pathophysiology internal hydrodelineation occurs during phaco emulsification and the separation of the plaque from its surrounding lens fibers and center of posterior capsule occurs and aspiration of this plaque reveals a discoid defect in the cortical sheet complex leading to the appearance of this sign the variance in the stage at which the defect appears is determined by the number of cleavage planes or rings formed during hydro as well as the adherence of the plaque so intraoperative ppcdd sign was observed on 87% of posterior polar cataract cases most commonly after epinuclear plate aspiration there was a higher incidence of intraoperative pcr in cases without this sign so the appearance of this sign during cortical aspiration is indicative of an intact pc during phaco emulsification in posterior polar cataract thank you Uh, you said that uh, you can see this. It, this is probably due to the hydrodelamination occurring uh, during the time of phaco emulsification. Uh, would you also be able to see this if you do a very thorough hydrodelamination <coughs> even before you start uh, emulsifying the cataract? Before emulsifying the cataract? Yeah. If it's uh, supposing it's a very clear cataract, uh, cataract except the posterior polar defect yes, which is sir. appearing, and if you do a very thorough hydrodelamination, yes, sir. if Sometimes it is due we to do hydro see even through the cataract, we yeah. can see it coming up, and yeah. there is a, def a pseudo defect behind. Yes, yes, sir. It's a true posterior polar cataract. You would never see it coming up during delamination okay. of the cortex. Because it's way behind it be where your fluid wave is going. End up doing an inadvertent, more or less hydro dissection. Then you're in trouble. Yeah. Pray. So, if, since you have forget about what the uh, masses to it as, but since you have access to preoperative ASOCT, and I believe that you get it done for every patient who has even a suspected posterior polar caps, posterior polar cataract. Have you ever come across a situation wherein you see this sign? and conclude that the PC is intact, but the ASOCT has suggested otherwise? No. So the ASOCT and this clinical finding are absolutely in sync with each other? Absolutely in sync, I, I cannot say, because I have not analyzed it per se, but no. If uh, ASOCT shows a defect and this sign is there in drop, no, that has not happened. So in cases in which we saw a defect on ASOCT, we have CPs, those have opened up. So if you do not have an access to an ASOCT, essentially your approach to this case, even if it's a suspected PPC with or without the sign, because this sign is coming up at a stage where 80% of your surgery is over. Yes, sir. So the precautions and the mind games and the trepidations and the jitters, they're all going to stay with the surgeon. Yes, sir. Right? Yes. So this is probably just another observational finding, but it yeah. doesn't really relieve the surgeon as of Towards now. Towards the end, because for the beginners, when they see this, often they think that they have a posterior capsular rent. Even when I was starting with surgery, I knew that I was very apprehensive that the PC has opened up. But actually, if you are seeing a rim and a central sign, that is indicative that you are safe at this stage, rather than worrying and shouting all over in the OT that I need this backup. So and I believe Naren's 3D comes in to help. <laughs> so you know exactly where the defect is, not in the, not in yeah. the posterior capsule. Yeah. Yeah, to my understanding, this is a sure, uh, sure shot sign which Dr. Professor Prithial has, you know, even put up in the ICR as, you know, he has yeah. published. It is a sure shot sign. Yeah. And it is a more of an intraop uh, intraop sign. It is a more of an intraop sign. Of course, the pre-op OCT will always give whether the PC is intact or not. Yeah. That apart, the intraop one is the one which is a catchy thing here. Yeah. Once you know that there's a defect, that tells that almost 80%, as you've shown, that the PC is intact and you can proceed ahead. Yes, sir. Which otherwise we all earlier thought it is a PC uh, rupture. Yeah. So now the this thinking has little changed we with this defect. We have residents uh, questioning yes. us during surgery that okay the PC has opened and then we tell them no you can see the rim yeah. and the PC is intact. 
so in our early stages of learning maybe this is more important clear yeah when the essentially the depth perception has not developed very yes, well sir. so would you allow those undeveloped or not fully developed depth perception surgeons to operate on a posterior cataract is the first thing so they have to learn some time <laughs> yeah but you know given, given told us we have to still take all the due precautions for yes, the ppc yes, it's only an additional uh, introp uh, uh, sign uh, with the oct on which we're going to confirm on this so all this uh, precaution you need to take thank you yeah. maybe thank you. just in support of her uh, exactly uh, yeah uh, the we, last, uh, we're, we're not the opposing last, her. The last <laughs> heartbeat <laughs> with you, when yes, you're sir. finally peeling off the final yes. cortex, yes. maybe at that point of time you are more relaxed. More relaxed, right. yes. Yes, nice. Thank you. Dr. Anita Bhargavi, she would be talking on impact of video versus verbal counseling on decision to choose IOL among Tamil speaking uh, patients. Good evening everyone. Today I am here to talk on topic impact of verbal and video assisted counselling on patients decision making to choose type of cataract surgery and lens implant. Introduction. Cataract blindness in India is about 8.25 million. Cataract surgery rate greater than 5000 surgeries per million population per year is performed in India. Cataract removal and IVOIL implantation is the only treatment option. With varied armamentary map choices, patient gets appalled by various types of cataract surgeries and different types of intraocular lenses. In literature, the available counseling methods are verbal, written and video based information. In ophthalmology, various published material are available to obtain consent process regarding the cataract surgery, but only few videos are available to explain the patient about the cataract surgery regarding their decision making. Why this study? Preoperative counseling regarding types of cataract surgery and IOLs helps patients to select treatment options according to their requirements to compare verbal versus video counseling and their impact on better patient understanding and decision making, whether video counseling can be used remotely by decision maker. Objectives. Primary objective is a patient to, to look for patient satisfaction following video counseling and to see uptake of type of cataract surgery and IOLs after two modalities are counseling. Secondary objective is to assess the role of economic factor in patient's final decision making. Methodology. Our study is a prospective randomized control trial. We do not mind patients included in the study, 101 in video counseling and 108 patients in verbal counseling, conducted in tertiary eye care hospital in South India. Total 209 patients included in study, which are randomized into two groups. Group 1 was for video counseling. Here, a 5-minute clear animated video is shown to the patient and their attender regarding the type of cataract, cataract surgeries, and different types of intraocular lenses available. Is it explained by the ophthalmologist? Group 2 is a video verbal counseling. Here, the trained verbal counselor is explained to the patient and their attender regarding the cataract surgery, same matched with the video counseling. After the counseling, the questionnaire, which is a 21 questionnaire, uh, where it shows the demographics and knowledge and satisfaction after the uh, counseling, the questionnaire is given to the patients and they ask them to fill. After that, counseling regarding charges is done, then final decision making is recorded. Inclusion criteria, patients undergoing cataract surgery for the first time, age group of 18 to 75, and patient willing to participate in this study. Exclusion criteria, patients with poor visual prognosis and patients with auditory impairment. Results, here a majority of patients are in the age group of 51 to 60 years and in the gender distribution, majority of the participants are males in both the counseling groups. This explains the gender defined roles which can be con confounded by socioeconomic status, literacy and marital status. In video counseling group, majority of patients and in from verbal counseling, majority of patients are may feel more confident about their decision making regarding the surgery. And majority of video counseling and verbal counseling patients are totally satisfied with their decision. This explains the, uh, here in this graph it shows that the knowledge and decision making, there is no statistically significant difference. Initial preference after the counseling, uh, most of the patients from video counseling have chosen 
the high end technology surgery uh, high end technology cataract and uh, ivols compared to the verbal counseling but after the final discussion on charges the final uptake has been drastically reduced in the video counseling group uh, and also in the verbal counseling this explains that economic factor plays a crucial role uh, in low economic uh, countries like india accompanied patients with the patients 20% are accompanied with the life partner and others with their uh, children or others like relatives neighbors but most of them have a decision maker as a life partner in the family uh, this explains that including decision maker uh, coming along with the patient accompanying along with the patient may finally increase the uptake of the cataract surgery and ivo lens type in verbal counseling counseling is done only once and there is no repetition patient unable to recall certain segments in video counseling audio with pictures for better understanding is given can be repeated and can be used remotely by decision makers this is a qr code which can be given to the patient and also uh, he can play he can play and uh, look at the video anywhere and any time along with the attender or any decision maker so that they can choose the high end lens or cataract surgery conclusions patients were able to choose better technology ivols after video counseling Final uptake after discussion of charges implicates that in our Indian scenario, economic factor plays an important role. Video counseling complemented with human interface or verbal counselor will achieve maximum fat patient satisfaction. Thank you. Uh, just one observation to make. Uh, I really appreciate uh, um, Dr. Anita for having come, come forward to present the paper even though she is, knows that uh, it's not uh, going to be judged. Uh, you take it as a stepping stone. Yes. And uh, uh, many people after knowing that uh, you are not eligible for uh, uh, being judged, they drop out and don't come. I really appreciate all those who come forward and present. Thank so, you, sir. Thank, thank you. you. May I just ask you a question just for uh, completion's sake. This uh, uh, verbally you interact, no? You have some doubt. The doubt is clarified from the counselor or from the doctor. Yes, but that sort of a provision is not there in the recorded version. Yes, Isn't it a disadvantage? Yes, As sir. Uh, that's why you finally Only the point which is uh, positive is the repeatability yes, with sir. the QR scanner and uh, they can keep on listening, the yes, attenders sir. can do. Yes, but verbally you clarify so many things, yes, you know, sir. as a doctor or a counselor. Yes, Isn't that a minus side of this? Yes, it is a disadvantage, but uh, finally uh, we thought that if it is complemented with verbal counselor human interface, the satisfaction levels can maximally improve. Yes, okay. Thank you, sir. I would request all the presenters to stay back because the uh, winner of this session is going to have to present again. We will be announcing, no, no, this is the semi-final session. And uh, we'll be joined by the winners from the other three cataract sessions. So please stay back, don't go. It might be difficult for us to locate you again and call you back. Because after a 10 minute gap, when we decide who is the winner from this session, we would be calling back the winner of this session plus the other three from the other cataract sessions. Uh, we go on to the next paper uh, by Dr. Shweta Sharma. Dr. Shweta. Visual outcome of multifocal versus monofocal intraocular lens in pediatric bilateral cataract cases. This paper presented is not there. Uh, we move on. Dr. Atik Rasina. She is going to talk about descriptive analysis of post op performance of monofocal IOL with modified aspheric anterior surface. Good afternoon, one on all. My paper is to, uh, uh, to know the descriptive analysis of post-operative performance of a monofocal eye world with modified aspheric anterior surface. I'm a second year MS postgraduate. The aim of my study is to analyze the post-operative performance of a monofocal eye oil with modified aspheric anterior surface. About the ICB-100 eye oil, cataract surgery with conventional monofocal eye oil implantation has shown very successful results for distant vision, but patient often requires spectacle correction for near vision. There came the multifocal eye oils, which has been developed to meet the patient's need for near vision, but there is a limit in usage due to increased incidence of subjective visual disturbance, including halos and glare. 
Extended computer use and younger age at cataract surgery, they also give rise to growing needs for intermediate vision. This ICB-100 IOL, it shares the same geometry as well as of ZCB-100 IOL, about 85% of the surface, except for the modified aspherical anterior surface of the optics. This unique anterior surface, it is intended to create a continuous power change from periphery to the center, inducing a continuous power <coughs> profile created with a higher order asphere and improves intermediate vision. The principle of this IOL is the peripheral aspheric profile is similar to the ZV100, uh, V100, reducing the spherical abrasions. It has a continuous power profile from periphery to the center. This extends the depth of focus, providing a better intermediate vision. It is based on the refractive technology without any diffractive rings or zones. But the photic phenomenon of this IOL is comparable with the uh, ZZB100 monofocal IOL. Materials and methods, it is a prospective descriptive analysis of a 40 eyes of patients who underwent cataract surgery with newer monofocal IOL ICB-100 with modified aspheric anterior surface that is designed to extend the depth of focus. Exclusion criteria, patients with ocular comorbidities and previous ocular surgeries were excluded from a study. Preoperative evaluation included distance and near visual acuity, intraocular pressure measurement using uh, Goldman applination tonometry, slit lamp biomicroscopy, fundus examination by indirect ophthalmoscopy, OCT macula using a six line scan, immersion biometry using SRKT formula was done for IOL power calculation. All patients underwent temporal phaco emulsification with ICB-100 IOL surgery by a single surgeon. Limbal based 2.8 mm incision was done followed by 360-degree continuous curvilinear capsulorexis. Nucleus removal was done by phaco emulsification. Cortex aspiration was done by bimanual irrigation and aspiration. And IOL implantation was done. All surgeries were uneventful. In the post-op evaluation, distance visual acuity using logmar chart was recorded, intermediate visual acuity using precision vision, and near visual acuity using Snellen's near vision chart was recorded. Spectacle corrected defocus curve plotting was done. Contrast sensitivity was measured using Pelly Robinson contrast, sensi contrast sensitivity. All patients, the contrast sensitivity was good. This is a defocus curve of the uh, newer monofocal ICB-100 IOL. This monofocal had a good distance visual acuity, and it also provided a better intermediate vision, and then uh, it was a, um, it provided, a dip. unlike other monofocal IOL, it didn't have a proper dip. This was the stat statistics of the 40 eyes of a patient, which we did, subjective refraction, near as well as the intermediate vision. Uh, this, this is also for the distance and the near as well as the intermediate was done. The results at one month follow-up, uncorrected and the best corrected distance visual acuity, defocus curve, near and intermediate vision. They showed that newer uh, monofocal IOL had improved intermediate or near performance apart from the excellence distance acuity that reflected well in subjective satisfaction as well. Conclusion of my study was this monofocal IOL with a modified aspheric anterior surface. They are good options for patients requiring better intermediate vision without compromising on contrast sensitivity and the quality of vision. Thank you. May I ask what was the lens used here? ICB-100 thickness, I hands IOL. I hands. So with that, uh, what was the near uh, maximum achievable uh, near vision? All patients of the SWATI eyes, they had about uh, plus 1 to plus 1.5 range they had near vision. No, the correction, what was achieved? What extent they could read, the near correction? N8, N6, that is what I meant. So you, yes. you said, what he's asking is, you said you are doing a defocus curving of every patient in the post-operative period. So what was the defocus you found at what distance, say at 60 centimeters, till what defocus did they achieve 2020? That is what he's asking. Was the patient uh, able to do computer work without any spectacle? Uh, with like a desk, desktop uh, activities on computer without spectacle, was any patient able to do? Yes, sir. With uh, plus one and point five, they were able to do. That is addition. Additional plus one, you mean? Addition plus one. Without any addition? It, they were able to do the intermediate vision, sir. Yes. So that's what he's asking. Computer exactly. work is intermediate. Yes, so without any glasses, they were able to. Glasses, harm, what, what was the percentage of patients where you found that? All of them? Uh, only two didn't, uh, two had, uh, two were not able to give the intermediate vision. All the other patients had. So what is your intermediate? How do you define that? And what distance from the eyes? At 66 centimeter, mm -hmm. with the precision vision, uh, they were able to. This is after binocular implant or monocular implant? After monocular implant. 
This is, I think, basically boils down to, you know, your uh, counseling and preoperative selection of the patient. What are the subset of patients whom you counsel for this kind of lens? Because I think basically you're talking some lens called eye hands, uh, <coughs> so which gives intermediate vision, not particularly uh, near vision. And uh, so you must have counseled uh, a particular subset of patients. So when they asked uh, computer, so did you, in your preoperative counseling, select such patients specifically for this lens? Patients who are uh, more with computer work and the IT professionals who require this intermediate vision, we, uh, we study showed that this uh, IOL had the better intermediate vision. We started a study of 40 eyes and we we had that uh, all patients had good <laughs> Yes, but uh, I mean, I don't know. The results sound just too good to me at the moment. So maybe you just have to expand your sample size and see it because after monoclear implant, it's not achieved in 38 out of 40 eyes. We are working on at it. At 60, yeah. So you need to expand study. your study maybe a little bit. That's exactly, you know, that monocular, maybe bionocular, there's one, one plus one added a little more for the near. But monocular with the other eye, either fakic or FA, I mean pseudo fake there could be a disparity. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, paper is uh, by Dr. Parihar. Major Dr. Parihar. In, uh, that was on uh, functional outcome after flax with toric IOL implantation in post RK cases. We come to the uh, final paper, residence learning curve analysis for MSICS using ICO OSCAR tool. Dr. Haripriya Arvind. Hari Priya, madam. So we give a gap of uh, just 10 Some minutes. We Three minutes, if in case any last call for the presenter who are not turned up. <laughs> 